Starkiller Base is one of, if not the most impressive, at least on a pure destructive scale, super weapons in Star Wars, and that includes both Legends and Canon. It can destroy an entire star system in a single shot, and although Episode 7 seems pretty clearly to show that it's somehow draining the energy from a star, in reality the process that Starkiller Base uses is much more complicated and, in my opinion, a little more interesting, even if unnecessary. In both Legends and Canon, the Empire has played a lot of emphasis into high energy research. We see, for example, an entire wing of the Maw installation in Legends dedicated to that very topic, which makes sense given, you know, the Death Star. However, Canon sees the Empire branch out into an even stranger method of finding and harnessing energy. It seems like by the Battle of Endor this technique had not been perfected, however, the initial research was left to remnants of the Empire and, of course, the First Order, which decades after Endor, according to the visual guide, managed to harvest what was called quintessence. Basically, quintessence was a type of dark energy, which could be stored extremely compactly, but of course could be launched with devastating effect. The quintessence would be collected in the core of Starkiller Base, would essentially roil around in there for some time, then an opening would be created which would allow it to escape basically the beginning stages of firing the weapon. To my knowledge at least, the First Order is the only faction which has used dark energy in Star Wars Legends and canon. We get a quote saying that in canon at least from Akbar. Impossible. Although we know there is more dark energy in the universe than anything else, and that it exists everywhere around us, it is so diffuse that it can be barely detected, let alone concentrated. This means that the First Order had access not only to a novel type of energy, but also a near-infinite one. Before really looking into this, I sort of just assumed that Star Killer Base used kyber crystals and the power of the star itself, but that's not quite right. As recently as the Visual Dictionary for Episode 9, it says that Star Killer uses the star as a gravitational lens. So I guess dark energy is being pulled from the surrounding area, not the star itself, which I do think contradicts with the intention of the movie, but does help explain away what most people consider Star Killer's biggest weakness. It has to consume a star each time it fires. Now we see it about to fire again in Episode 7, so that doesn't really make sense and this does help explain it. It's not really the light of the star being drawn in, the star is sort of focusing the dark energy which comes down and I guess blocks out the light. But I know what you're saying. Isn't that inconsistent with what the movie shows and with Star Wars Resistance? Well, probably, but it's what they gave us in the Episode 7 novelization and that's been continued and sort of supported throughout the visual guides up until Episode 9, and I don't see that changing at this point. So, because that's the most explicit explanation, I'd say that Starkiller Base, despite appearing to run off some sort of solar energy or just energy generally, runs off of dark energy. And specifically what's called Quintessence, which has also appeared in the Star Wars Rebel Files. So presumably then Starkiller Base could fire with another large gravitational body as a sort of lens, although admittedly it's hard to find something as massive as a star. It also perhaps means that the process may not actually extinguish a star, and if it doesn't that it can fire again, just using the same lens. Now again, I know this contradicts some stuff from Star Wars Resistance where they find the sort of star killer based testing ground, but it is what it is. It also explains why, to my knowledge at least, star killer base has never been described or shown to have engines. I could be wrong about this, but although many fans did assume that star killer base must have engines to get new power for shots, the reference books and the cross sections don't show them, so it's possible that it doesn't actually consume the star and again is using this aforementioned process. To my knowledge, Starkiller Base, too, has also been described as inhabiting the same place that Ilum originally did. I believe that was picked out by Star Wars Explained back in the day, who was one of the first that I know who theorized that the two planets were the same. So I think that leads further credibility to it not actually moving. But it's not just its unique method of charging, or its energy source which makes Starkiller Base overpowered, there's also the method that it fires. Starkiller Base uses an otherwise completely unknown dimension to actually fire the weapon. It's what's known as sub 
Hyperspace. Here's what the episode 7 novelization says. I can't either, but those of us assigned to the base heard rumors that it doesn't operate in what we'd call normal hyperspace. It fires through a hole in the continuum that it makes itself. Everybody was calling it sub-hyperspace. That's how it can arrive in moments across a distance like that between the base and the Hosnian system. So unlike, say, the Galaxy Gun, which used a projectile through hyperspace, which obviously takes some time, Starkiller Base can attack another side of the galaxy almost immediately which is fairly impressive, obviously. And this is also why, apparently, there is this rip in space which allows people to see the disaster as it's happening. And this lore has also been confirmed outside of the novelization. We have the visual dictionary saying, the weapon array of the Star Killer punches a hole through hyperspace, sending the torrent of energy to a target light years away. However, there are still some limitations to that. First of all, engineers do use planetary masses and other stellar bodies to help calculate the projectile's root, Starkiller Base has to actually be pointing in the right direction, and it relies on the mass of the bodies to actually rip the beam back into real space. When the energy transmits into sub-hyperspace, it's called phantom energy, and here's what the novelization says. Assuming that the rotation and inclination of the planet had been taken into account, the released blast of concentrated phantom energy would travel along a perfectly linear path, punching a small, big rip and that's the exact words of the novelization, through hyperspace itself until it left the galaxy, or encountered something in its path that was of sufficient mass to intercept it. So there are a couple of weaknesses here, still not enough to counter the overpowering facts that we've learned today. It sounds like the weapon needs significant time and mathematics to aim, and perhaps, and this is something we can cover in a later video if you guys are interested, there might be a method to block it using, say, large interdiction generators. Before I finish this topic, I will note that quintessence is a form of dark energy that hypothetically exists in the real universe, so it's one of those cases where Star Wars kind of takes from science and takes the scientific principles, which is always interesting. At least loosely borrows the science. On another note too, this isn't the only example of Star Wars factions using exotic or strange forms of energy. There were a couple of legend sources, I believe, which talked about generators orbiting black holes, and they would use some of the material that they'd gain from being there to help power things like repulsor lifts. I don't know exactly how that would work, but exotic and esoteric physics and energy I think is pretty cool, and I wouldn't mind seeing more of it in Star Wars, just hopefully next time it jives a lot better with what we see, you know, on screen. But that's all I have for you guys today. Let me know what you thought of this video, if you enjoyed it, and which lore you prefer. The seemingly obvious explanation we get in the movie, or the more complex one we get in the novelization and the other lore. Before we leave, we do have a hashtag ask at question of the day, and today's comes from Danielle, who asks, how much do Octuptara droids weigh? Well, Danielle, in polite company, we do not ask droids about their political affiliation, their age, how much money they make, or of course, their weight. So obviously, I cannot answer that, but maybe Google can. Until next time though guys, have a great one, and as always, may the force be with you.